Hi, and I'm glad to be here. It wasn't easy to come, French strikes and everything. So this talk will be about uh, taming the fox. Uh, the title doesn't mean much, but taming was for uh, the first name of a syscall on OpenBSD, which was tame before, which became plage. And the fox is, of course, Firefox, you can see. So who's this guy? Uh, I'm a French guy living in the center of France, far from Paris. Uh, for work, I work in the GIS field, everything which relates to aerial pictures, cadastral information, uh, GIS databases. Uh, I've been working on OpenBSD ports since a long time. I've been uh, hacking on Firefox since a long time too. I've been so contributing to XFC, the desktop environment, since forever. In the end, of course, when you start hacking on things, you end up being the maintainer for the ports. And same thing, I became the de facto maintainer for the geographic subdirectory in the ports tree since forever too. So the topic of the day, uh, five years ago, I did a presentation at EuroBSDCon in Paris, and in the closing, uh, Slides there were, yeah, maybe there could be some sandboxing with a pledge, which was a new thing at the time uh, in OpenBSD. And uh, I think the pledge and unveil semantics were not com completely finished. Uh, at the time, WebRTC was also a challenge because having WebRTC working on BSD wasn't a given. So I just tried it. It was easy at the beginning, writing some code, trying to figure out where to put it. It took some years to get there, but now it's free working. Of course, over the time, I was already confi confident I knew the code base of Firefox, but it, it's still huge. Uh, for that, there's one friend, which is Searchfox, which allows you to grip and find everything in the code. It's really well done. It was really a great help. So, talking about Firefox on OpenBSD first. What we have right now, we have uh, four main ports. The main Firefox uh, main line, I would say, which is the last version. The next version is out uh, in two days. We also have a Firefox ESR branch. Same thing, it's up to date. I've been keeping it up to date without issues since uh, many years. Uh, Thunderbird too, which is also from the Mozilla Galaxy. This one um, doesn't benefit from the pledge and unveil work because right now it's still a one process uh, monster, but we'll come back to it. There's also Tor Browser in the port tree. I don't maintain it, but uh, we have a, a developer who's, who's been really ma maintaining it really well since, uh, since some years. Uh, most of those ports are also available in stable because most of the time you can backport updates except, of course, when a new version of Rust is required, a new version of LLVM, a new version of CBindGen, and you have to go through oops and loops to uh, backport things. But most of the times, people using a uh, release version of uh, OpenBSD can benefit from the security updates of Firefox on stable. We have uh, working WebRTC. I've been using WebRTC for work in Firefox on OpenBSD for years. Of course, the pandemic helped uh, people uh, test that. We have WebGL, and we also have the multi-process work, with, which, which has been done upstream. And we have, uh, right now, we have uh, six different processes. The main process, content processes for web content, GPU for the interaction with the uh, graphic card, RDD is for a remote data decoder, which means all the Video, uh, video decoding stuff happens in a, in a separate process. Uh, the socket process is a new one. It's the one which is supposed to do all the network communication. Right now, upstream, it's only used for WebRTC communications. The, all the, co the network communications for web pages and DNS is still done in the main process. And there's also a recent addition of the utility processes. Uh, right now, it's only used for audio decoding. So now, general view of what's, what means sandboxing. I'm not a security expert, definitely not. I'm an OpenGSD developer, so I'm working on ports. I know the general concepts of the things which are being developed in OpenBSD, but I'm not 
that much knowledgeable about all the details. To me, what's, what's sandboxing? There are different uh, mechanisms exist, existing depending on operating systems. So, so on OpenBSD, we have Plange and Unveil. On Linux, there's SecComp. On FreeBSD, there's Capsicum. Uh, Landlock, from what I've got, is more or less the same idea as Unveil implemented uh, on Linux uh, security modules. And well, what, 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 do we, what do we mean when we say something? To me, it's we limit what a process can do. We limit how much resources that, that it uses. What can it see about each other? Like, are you the only one running on this machine, or are there neighboring processes? Can you talk with them or not? Are you allowed to talk with them or not? And what can you read and write on the file systems? Um, it might not be a given, but for us, I think the main driver for this unboxing work was we want to prevent a process accessing files that it's not supposed to, uh, to access for its uh, nominal use. That's something uh, we, uh, we, we stress because in, the, in its nominal uh, work, a process isn't supposed to access many, uh, many other files. But if the process gets owned for, very, for various reasons and you get shell codes and you, might, and you get remote code execution, of course, an attacker would want to access sensitive files. Your SSH keys, your GPG keys, the passwords, in TC password, IPSX databases. That's something that isn't supposed to happen in a normal usage, but you never know what, web, what a web page can execute on your machine. Of course, inside a browser, there are also many mechanisms to, present, to prevent this unwanted access. But those mechanisms can also be uh, worked around, and those kind of things can still happen. So the idea was to have something else at the operating system level. Of course, there's already some boxing in Firefox which exists, there's well, the, web, the web page disturbing the, the work of stream. It's maintained by the Mozilla Foundation on tier one platforms, of course, Linux, Mac OS, uh, Windows, of course. There are still many users of Firefox. Even most of the, the, the people here might use Chrome, but there are still around 10, 20% of people using Firefox, for, to my knowledge. The sandboxing uh, on those platforms is done by process type. So, of course, it's closely linked to uh, separating everything from the main process to sub-processes. That's something which has been uh, very hard in the Mozilla community because the code base is more than 20 years old now. It hasn't been written from scratch like Chromium does, which was built from the scratch to be uh, privileged, separated, and everything. So that's, that work in, uh, in Firefox was much more complicated. But slowly, it ended up being separated in many processes. And this work is still ongoing. Electrolysis was the uh, original split into many processes. And fission is now a work which is supposed to uh, separate the various tabs from, from your browser session so that they don't see each other, so that you can't have third party trackers seeing what happens in other tabs, that kind of thing. And so the sandboxing exists on the maintained platforms by Mozilla. And it's super fine grained, but it's not really easy to uh, grasp and comprehend because there are uh, thousands of lines of code, thousands of lines of configuration, and many smart people working on it. This is done with the, what, what the operating system is providing to the developers. So it's, uh, it's built, I think it's well done, and the user doesn't see that the process is sandboxed. But still, the browser on those platforms can access any files on the file system, which might not be what you want. So what we have on OpenBSD since 2017, 18, 16, I don't really remember. We have two syscalls. The first one is pledge, which says, which a, a process has to call this, this function and say, I pledge that I'm not going to use more than those syscalls. The, the promise uh, concept is that there's a word, which means I'm going to use this subset of syscalls. 
You call it once, you, call, you can call it many times, but if you call it many times, you only have to shrink the amount of promise you are taking. And if you, say, and if you call pledge without any argument, right, that means you're not going to use any syscall anymore. You're just going to get killed at some point because you are not allowed to do anything with the, with the kernel, which means in the end, that's what the, the, the sentence comes from the main page. You can only do computation on memory shared by another process because otherwise anything you're doing ends up calling in, in the kernel. And if you do something else, you get killed. Easy, straight away, you get killed. Unveil on the other side, which came after pledge, you call it with a path and a mode, and it, and it means that you are going to unveil to this process a part of the file system with this mode, either write, uh, read, write, create, or execute. You can call it as many times as you want, and in the end, the process will have a view of this part of the file system, this part, and this part, and this part, and be able to do write, maybe, or only read operation, or only executable operations. And if you call it with null, null, it means from that point, you are, you are going to run with only what you have, and you are not going to get more view of the file system. And if you try to access a pass, and it's not in the unveil list, well, the system will tell you it doesn't exist. Or if you have read access and try to write to it, it will just say to you, you don't have access to the file. Uh, from that point, the, the question is, when do you have to call them in the process lifecycle? Usually, it's uh, most of the processes have an initialization part, and after that, that's the main loop in, in the case of a daemon. So you have to really uh, figure out when, when is the best place to call those, those syscalls. Uh, open everything that you need before, and, and from that point, you just pass uh, file descriptors and everything, that kind of thing. That those syscalls are done by process, which means you can fork, and the new process will also have to decide what it wants to access. It's totally declarative. You don't do it from outside. The process, in its code, has to say, I know I'm, go I'm supposed to only use these uh, subsets and those files. I need to access to those files. And something else, too, a process can't know if it has been pledged or unveiled. It doesn't have a way to know, am I being sandboxed or not? And if, in that case, do something else. That's not possible uh, with OpenBSD, uh, the, the system. So the, the, pledge, the pledge classes, those, as I said, those are subsets. Uh, the first list is an example of the promises used by the main Firefox process. As you can see, the list is large, but in the end, it makes sense. The main process has to do read and write operations, write mostly for the cache, the profile, that kind of thing, and it, has, it also has to do write operations. To, uh, when you save a file, it has to be written somewhere. Of course, it has to do uh, network operations, DNS. Since it's multi-process, it has to fork exec processes. It has to send file descriptors to the, those sub-processes. It also needs PS VM info that uh, in Firefox, we have about processes, which shows all the processes used by Firefox with the memory usage. If you don't go to that page and you don't have the PS and VM info uh, pledge classes, the process will work. But as soon as you go to this page, it will use those these calls, and it will get killed. So you have to have them by default. Otherwise, you get the browser killed every time. And there are many other classes for various details. I think I checked yesterday, and the TTY class isn't necessary anymore. Uh, you need video, of course. If you want to use WebRTC, you, you need to uh, do uh, IOCTL on the, video, on, the, on the video device. So the, the list is, is huge, but those days, most of the things happen in the browser. So of course, it has to have many capabilities. There are some quirks, routes, multicast for some specific uh, IOCTLs. I, I won't come go, uh, go into the details. But Firefox doesn't use all the pledge classes possible. Firefox can't do IOCTL on audio because it uses the SNDIO uh, subsystem that, that's not needed. Uh, Firefox doesn't change PF rules. Of course, Firefox doesn't write routes to your routing table. So it still has some limitations compared to a process that, would be, uh, that wouldn't be pledged at all. So that's an example of reuse. And 
those are small examples of the ports tree, other ports, when, where we, uh, the, the, the ones that are used a lot, that we experimented adding pledges, depend, depending on what the processes need to do. And in the end, it was, much, it was very, very, very simple. Uh, update icon cache, which is something that is run all the time when you install a package. It's run every time you install a package which has icons. So it's something that might be critical, might as well pledge it and figure out it only needs to do this, write files, more or less. Desktop file utils is a similar example. Uh, a PDF, PDF uh, display application. You have shitloads of uh, dangerous things in PDFs those days because they can execute JavaScript. Everything can happen. And in the end, new PDF, as an example, only needs STDIO and RPATH to open the file that you are given on the, on the command line, and then it just needs STDIO. Anything that's, in, that's uh, bundled in the PDF file that might be dangerous will end up with the process getting killed instead of the dangerous thing inside the PDF getting executed. Archivers are also a good, uh, a good target for being pledged because there are many, many uh, dangerous things being tried being bundled in, uh, in the archives. Those examples are the same. You can open the file and then just say, I'm going to reduce my privilege to, because I don't need anything else. Most of the base demons are pledged. Uh, most of the utilities are when it makes sense, of course. So that was for pledge. Now for unveils or other examples. I took the same examples. Update desktop database. It just needs to browse all the desktop uh, directories that are uh, where the, the, the packages install desktop files. And after that, you don't need to access anything else. If there was a malicious desktop file, it couldn't do anything else because it couldn't read anything else. Uh, shared name m 4 is the same thing. It needs to uh, write in a directory, in a single directory in the, in the file system, and it needs to read the file that's given. It doesn't need to know what exists anywhere else. Uh, GOT, which is the Git implementation uh, written uh, in a clean room uh, by uh, Stefan Sperling, which is meant for OpenBSD to potentially replace CVS someday. It has been written with Prefsep and Pledge and Unveil from the start, so it's a very, very good example of how to use Unveil and Pledge in a, in a program. And of course, most of the base demons use uh, Unveil those days. So how does it happen in Firefox for the users? Well, since we have uh, six different processes and we have two types of uh, syscalls to uh, configure, we have two files per process type. I decide of the defaults because that those are the ones that we have to, uh, to use and document why do we need this subset, why do we need this directory. So of course, you have comment in the file. And those configuration files are sampled in OTC Firefox which means that a user can override them and add directories, remove a sub, uh, syscall class, a pledge class. If he knows that he's good, not going to use video, for example, you can remove it from the pledge.main uh, file. That also means that for some specific use case, you can disable those uh, protections if you want to. I know of one case, uh, which I'll come back later, but you're not supposed to do that for your own good. Those files are read at process startup. We'll come back to that later. And you have some environment files which are expanded to real paths because uh, the XDG, the, the free desktop specifications, say that, that you can override some defaults using those uh, environment, environment variables. That's, that's quite simple so far. Of course, the slides will be online just after the talk. All the, all the links are pointing to the code inside uh, Firefox if you are interested in, really in uh, finding out how much lines of code it, it is compared to what is sandboxing on other platforms. That's the a short e excerpt of unveil those main for the main process. As examples, it needs to write to the cache directory for all the GIF and PNG files you're seeing when you're browsing. So it needs read access, write access, Create access to create subdeals, of course. It needs to, same thing, access dot, dot Mozilla slash Firefox subdeal. 
which means it's, that's where the profiles are. It needs read and write access to the graphic card if you want to do graphic operations, mostly WebGL. It needs read and write access if you want to do uh, WebRTC. It needs read access to the libraries, GTK, all those things. It needs read and execute access to the install uh, directory of Firefox because since it's going to execute itself for the sub-processes, it's, it's need, it needs to be executed uh, to have the exec execute rights on this directory. Which is that on the USR local li li library path, there's only read access. It can't execute anything in this directory. And the last example is you might want to use external uh, MIME handlers to open attachments, to open uh, files that you're going to download. So you just have to specify manually the path of the binary that you're going to use to open PDF, open images, open video, let's say. So there are conflicting opinions about this. When should we call pledge and unveil a program? I've looked at how it has been done uh, in the base daemons and base programs, and it's easy because that's a code base that you are maintaining that is maintained in the OpenBSD project and you have the, the full rights and you, of doing anything you want with it and you know it, you've read it, many people looked at it. So it, of course it's easy to move chunk of, chunks of code from one place to another because it makes much more sense to have uh, this thing initialized here instead of late because this way you can remove a pledge promise or you can uh, change an unveil configuration. In theory, that's how it's done for all the base demons, but for a program like Firefox, that's not really possible. You can't, it's not possible to figure out all the code paths, what causes what, because uh, this morning there was a slide from Daryl Beatty about the, the number of lines of code of books and then Linux and then FreeBSD. And I think if you look at the size of the source code of a browser, it's much higher. So it's not, it's not possible to understand everything how it works. So in the end, let's just be humble and just say, okay, for the other platforms, they start taking the sandboxing at this point, at this place. Let's just do something simple and start the sandboxing and configure it at the same place. Uh, there was a nice idea which was uh, taken from Windows. I managed to remove lots of uh, writes from the remote data decoding process by preloading a library. It, it allowed me to remove uh, uh, many, many things from the unveil configuration and the pledge configuration for the RDD process because you just preload the library before, uh, create, before starting the sandbox and it won't need to access the directory where the library is. So in the end, I think the, the remote data decoder process doesn't have access to anything, which means it can't read another library and try to exploit another thing. Uh, in the end, it's four functions in the, in the Mozilla code base, which are maybe 300 lines at the maximum. You start the sandbox, which means uh, where are my configuration files, the default ones, or ones that have been potentially uh, modified by the, by, the, by the users. Then you call a pledge with those configurations, and then you call a unveil with all those configurations, like with all those configuration lines, and from that point, the sandboxing is working. For all the processes, there's a, an entry point where the process, is, the process is started by the main process. Same thing, just call start on this distant box, telling it you have to read those two files for this process type. And the funny thing is, I, I realized uh, two, two weeks ago, the official Mozilla documentation, which is the last link on the page, says if you add a new process type to the Firefox code base, which is something that doesn't happen much, well, you have to uh, add these uh, lines for starting, open, uh, for starting the sandboxing, and just below it, there's a nif def open BSD start open BSD sandbox, which is nice because I didn't even knew it. But if a Mozilla developer would create a new process, by default, if it takes if it takes the code example in the documentation, it will add a configuration for open BSD, which is quite nice. Oh, it happened. Well, when you want to uh, add some boxing to a new process type, if you only have one frame, it's catch rates. Because you can't read all the code 
all the code base for this new process. You have no idea which uh, functions are going to be called. You just have to examine the process from an outside point of view. Ktrace is your only friend in this, in this case. You figure out, OK, start the process. It gets killed. It gets killed. OK, Ktrace. OK, it tried to call this syscall. Let's add this pledge class. OK, it goes further. It gets killed. OK, new syscall. OK, new class and everything. In the end, you end up with a subset of classes. And of course, you will get new crashes because you haven't started unveil. So Ktrace tells you that this file has been uh, opened for read. This file has been open, uh, opened for write. So you slowly get the list of paths that the, this process needs for its nominal usage. So repeat until it stops crashing and starts working. Of course, Firefox itself is a huge code base, but it also uses existing libraries. So you also need to take care about what does GTK does below, what does X does below, which means you also add to add new uh, syscall classes or paths because GTK uses this uh, file and you don't have the choice of avoiding this access. So it takes a lot of time to figure out all the details. Contrary to Chromium, uh, the Mozilla Foundation is very welcoming to uh, other operating systems. For us, uh, the BSDs, we are, let's say, tier three, which means they don't spend much time about it, but if you try to push things, they will welcome it. But you just need to uh, use Bugzilla and talk to the Mozilla developers in, uh, responsible for those specific areas, and they are welcoming ideas. Uh, they, are they are quite helpful on how to write your code. And that's the short list. That, well, actually, that's the half of the bugs that were about upstreaming all the modifications we had over time. Uh, the numbers on the right are the version of Firefox in which the code landed, which means the original uh, pledge implementation was in 63, so 2018. And over time, uh, at, the, at the start, it was uh, about config keys to configure the pledge because it was still uh, in its early days. Then it moved to configuration files because about config keys <laughs> have an issue. Something can eventually modify them. So if the process can modify the config keys, of course it can give him itself more rights. So offloading that to a configuration file which isn't modifiable by anyone but root makes it uh, tighter. So that's the first part. The second part, you can see from the titles what were the bugs that were created, regressions, or uh, what were the additions to modify the sandboxing for OpenBSD inside the Mozilla code base. The last one is a bit painful for me because I spent quite some time recently to uh, try to remove a pledge class because it was calling the sysctl that I thought maybe I can just cache the value, call it from at the start and then cache the value and then use it and return it for the, all the next calls. And in the end, I just figured out, okay, I, when I was testing, I just forgot to remove the class from the configuration file. So my, my testing showed that it worked. But in the end, when I removed the class from the configuration, it just crashed because, of course, another path in the code base was calling a different CCTL, but which was still prevented by pledge. So it's a lot of work and all trying to find what calls what. For what does it mean for the end users? It doesn't see, the user doesn't see much because it's transparent. The only thing that is user visible, by default, uh, the browser can only write to TMP and home slash downloads. Which means on OpenBSD, if you use Firefox, the browser can access, can't access your home directory with all your uh, sensitive personal files, SSH keys and everything. It has a drawback since it's only downloads. If you want to upload things, well, you have to put them to downloads. Oh, well, you can add new paths to the unveil configuration, but you're not supposed to add your home directory because it would defeat the idea of not allowing the browser to access all your files. Uh, there's one gotcha. If you want to use the screen sharing in WebRTC, you need to disable pledge on the main process because it uses uh, SSM gate, which doesn't have any uh, pledge class for now, and I 
I am pretty sure uh, it's, it won't happen. Uh, there's an open bug about using XImage instead, but I don't really remember the details. It just filed the bug to, as a reminder to try to figure out something that avoids using this syscall, which in the end would uh, improve the security of this, uh, this part of the process. And as I said, the user needs to add all the MIME handlers he wants to use to open files. Uh, in my case, I use something to use to open archives in a graphical uh, application, um, an image viewer, and of course LibreOffice for all your office documents. But that's all you need to open files externally from the browser. In the end, over those years, I'm pretty happy of what's, what's been done because I have much, much better understanding of what's needed by all processes. All of them need STDIO, SendFD, ReceiveFD, RPATH. Of course, there are multi-processes involved. You can't do much without those uh, syscall classes. The main process and the content process still have access to many directories and many uh, syscalls because, as I said, the code base is old. Uh, it uses uh, external libraries. It hasn't been written uh, with sandboxing from the start, I'm pretty sure uh, it won't be possible to reach the level of sandboxing that is used right now in Chromium because since it was done from the start with sandboxing in mind, those ideas were uh, done correctly from the start. The remote data decoder process only needs to access slash TMP, can't read any other files. The socket process only does uh, INET and DNS, of course, and it doesn't have access to the file system. It doesn't need access to the file system. That's one less thing to worry about. Um, the audio decoder process needs uh, prot exec is a, sub uh, is a syscall class to say you're going to uh, use mmap and make that uh, memory region executable. I'm pretty sure that's only needed because some libraries that are used by this process to decode audio, need to execute something. And that's something which is outside of Firefox. You can't have control on all the libraries which are used by the, the browser. Uh, the GPU process, it was, it was a sandbox from the start, but right now I, have, I don't really know if it's still in use by the, by the browser because uh, you also have to play catch up with the upstream developers enabling or disabling the GPU process by default for all platforms, for one platform because it started working on, win on Windows and then on Linux and then it's been disabled because something changed about Wayland. You need to play catch up all the time to figure out if the things that were true three years ago are still true right now. There's an interesting issue about uh, the Unveil implementation right now, which is if a directory doesn't exist, and if you unveil it with read, write, and create uh, capabilities, well, the, the directory will be created if, you, if the, the code creates it, but the next calls won't be able to read it. That's a bit uh, counterintuitive, but it makes sense when you look at the implementation because uh, it's done on, based on uh, in the internals on the first layer, which does the mapping between a path and an inode. But it's annoying because as a user, if you have a new user and you, and you start Firefox with a default configuration, you have a new user, uh, home slash downloads doesn't exist. So you start the browser, it creates a directory when you want to download something, but then it will say, I failed to download it because it managed to create the directory, but since it's the f it, it, uh, it was unveiled before being created, it won't be able to write to it. So you need to exit the browser and then restart it, but then the, from that point, the directory exists, so it just works, but that's part of the little queries that are documented in the package readme. And as I said, everything might be revisited after each upgrade. That's something that is not really possible to do. I try to do it once every six months, start with, from, the, from an empty configuration, and try to figure out if you can tighten all the rules that you had, or for some cases, if you need to add uh, more paths or more uh, syscall classes. So that's coming to the end. Uh, 
by default, it's been enabled in the port tree since Firefox 60. So I'm pretty sure you know it, but in OpenBSD, security is enabled by default everywhere. So it's in the default configuration for everything. Unveil was added in 2019. Everything is upstream. Um, I never, I mostly never add patches to the port tree, which aren't or already either committed or tracked upstream being reviewed, because otherwise it's a maintenance nightmare. I, as as Mark said, for Chromium there are 900 uh, patches uh, in the port tree. For Firefox there are uh, five or six patches maybe, because the developers are just welcoming from all the, the, the support for other operating systems, as soon as you don't try to break everything and you adapt to the rules of the upstream project. Of course, the promises could be seen as wide, but as I said, it's a huge and old code base, so you can't do really what you want. Uh, upstream is still working to move things out of to different processes. The network communications are slowly moving from the main process to the socket process. At some point, maybe the, the main process won't have network access because it won't need to. But in the end, to do this work, it's a bit raw. You have k trace, you have a bit of logging, but it's very, very, very tedious and painful. That's what I added to the, to the upstream repository. You can use some logging, which will tell you this process has been started right now. So if you start the process and see a crash, you can figure out if it was before or after calling unveil, if the pass was in the list of the things that were allowed to this process. And other than that, you can only use K-Trace. So you are alone with K-Trace and your computer and your crane because it's somewhat painful. But let's finish on a, on a good note. I really liked it because uh, at the beginning, people mostly told me, yeah, it's not possible, this code base is shit, all the browsers are shit, all the code that has not been written by OpenBSD developer is shit. I don't agree with that. There are many, many, many smart people working on many, many, many projects, and there are many, many smart people working at Mozilla. They have their own views on how things are done. So it was very interesting to try to shoehorn the, a huge code base, shoehorn how the OpenBSD view of sandboxing in that monster. Thank you. And as I wanted, I have time for questions. Questions? Was this on? Do you have any way to um, almost like run a, a dry run mode for your uh, sandboxing so that you don't have to debug everything with K-Trace? So run things as if everything is enabled but don't actually kill the process and just like log the calls that it would make? Uh, you have one thing uh, in pledge, which is you can add the error class. In that case, I don't really remember what it does, but the process doesn't get killed. But that's not going to be very helpful because in the end, you still need to use K-Trace. K-Trace is not perfect, but it, it's what gives you the best uh, view of what the, process, the different processes do. And with K-Trace, you can uh, trace all the process, I mean the main process and the sub-processes. And after that, it's more or less uh, filtering which processes you're interested to. Uh, using timing to figure out what is called before this thing, but it's really a black box uh, debugging. But since you have all the source code, um, that's another issue because you have the source code, but you can't easily run uh, that, uh, that huge code base within GDB. Uh, the Mozilla developers wrote uh, RR, which is something which works on many platforms, but not, uh, I, I, haven't, I haven't tried on OpenBSD, which is uh, run and replay, which uh, is more or less execute a process, capture what it does, 
and then uh, do step by step forward in, in the in the process uh, code paths, which might be very helpful in this case. But other than that, you can just say if you have a pledge violation, just log an error. But that's not much um, not much not not much more honestly. So yeah, K trace. Any further questions? Yeah, you probably won't be surprised about that one. Is there any plan to actually put the user file requester into a separate process that wouldn't be unveiled so that you could choose to save a file anywhere and pass the file descriptor to unveil the process? You will have to talk to Mozilla developers first. Uh, <laughs> is it, no, it, it's an easy one, but uh, seriously, um, I don't think it's, it's that easy. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, I, 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 I know of one thing. Uh, if the ID is taken by the upstream developers, of course we can adapt to it, but we are not going to be the ones driving this effort. Yeah. And I know it's painful to have only home slash downloads. I got used to it, and I use it this way since years. Uh, sometimes you have to accept the fact that security comes with a price. Yeah, the, the other part of the question is, are we the actual only operating system that uh, has something like Unveil so that elsewhere you can save your files anywhere and it's not that painful? Um, I've, I'm going to rephrase the question to make sure that I understood it right. Are we the oper only operating system when we can restrict the view of the file system? Uh, I think the Linux developer working on Longlock are mostly going for the same goal. The idea is to uh, hide from the process all the things it doesn't need. So I, I think Longlock is supposed to be more or less the same on Linux. But other than that, honestly, the sandboxing on the other platforms, since I don't use other platforms, I didn't really experience what are the user-facing effects of having sandboxing on Linux having some boxing on Windows. I'm pretty sure it's been done by the upstream developers in a smart way to avoid uh, attackers to access unwanted files. But I'm not sure uh, they are, I'm pretty, uh, the, the sec comp uh, sandboxing for Linux has a white list of paths. So I'm pretty sure there's not dot SSH in it, but I'm not sure uh, what happens if you try to do something else and access this file? I'm pretty sure on Linux, Windows, Mac OS, you can upload your SSH keys through the, browser, the, the GTK upload file, but that's something that you are going to do as a user. I don't know which code paths are used. If uh, an attacker uh, takes control of a process and tries to do some smart things with shell codes or remote code execution with assembler and everything and try to access the same files. But honestly, you have to give the Mozilla developers credit for doing things smartly. All the new releases that are out always fix security bugs. And since the code base is huge, you can't fix everything. But I'm pretty sure the current state isn't that bad. OK, thanks. But it's more that on OpenBSD, we added another layer, which is annoying, of course. You can't access anything else that's TMP and downloads, but at least you, make, you are sure that the operating system won't give access to sensitive files in all cases. Anyone else? Thank you, Audrey. Thank you.